There's two questions that we need to keep in mind when we're discussing the coronavirus. The first is, why is there such a focus on the fatalities and the fatality rate? And second, why is there all this panic? Now, in order to do that, I wanted to pull up some of the numbers so we can sort of just go over what it is that we're actually talking about. Now, I want to pull up the um, NCOV 2019 website that I often pull up and sort of go over, again, why it is important to look at these numbers, what they say and what they don't say. So again, the website uh, tallies total confirmed cases, total deceased, serious, and total recovered. They come to a fatality rate of about 6%. The issue is that the 6% is arrived at by simply calculating what percent of 1,082,000 is 58,000, that's 6%. The issue is that without knowing the infection rate, so how many people are actually being infected, then the fatality rate is somewhat useless because it's not actually the true fatality rate since way more than a million people have this disease. Now, there have been a number of countries, such as Iceland has done some testing, and a number of other places where people have had the virus, may not even have known that they had the virus because they were asymptomatic, which means that they had no symptoms at all. They didn't, you know, they, they didn't have any shortness of breath. They had no issue. They maybe had a, you know, mild cold-like something, but they, they didn't um, chalk it up to COVID-19. And so those people are not reporting. And as we'll see a little bit later on from Ontario, there's not really a way to know, even by the government's own recommendations, what the true infection rate is. So that causes a major problem, and any then projection of numbers and fatality rates is going to be wildly, wildly off balance. That brings me to Dr. Peter Donnelly's uh, press conference on Friday, where they discussed the projections of fatalities that Ontario might have on April 30th. So there's a couple of issues. Before I get to the numbers, though, I want to talk about how they're arriving at the projections. And so Donnelly himself says, um, it's not true that mortality projections for Ontario were delayed. He says the projections are not dependent on testing data, but are rather based on the global experience of COVID-19 thus far. Again, if you're not testing people, you don't know how many people will have it. You don't know the fatality rate. You don't not necessarily know the infection rate. It's going to be very, very hard to draw concrete numbers because you're your projections can be wildly different if you simply change one of the factors. If you change the infection rate, if you change the total confirmed rate, if you change the death rate, all these numbers are going to make the result totally, totally different. And so this focus on the numbers is really just questionable. Now let's go to the numbers actually. Now Ontario has this chart and right away you probably notice a couple of problems the same as I did just by looking at it. Now I want to start on this side with problem number one. That is full future intervention. They are projecting that by April 30th, we'll have 200, uh, 200 fatalities. So my question is, what does full future intervention mean? We're already on a pretty, you know, pretty high state of, of uh, quarantine. Um, you know, some people are even in, in uh, uh, like an enforced quarantine, mandatory lockdown. So what does that mean? What's going to be different? Are we talking about martial law? Are we talking about people getting tickets? Are we talking about something else? You know, what does it mean? for a full intervention compared to what it is that we're doing now, because I know to a lot of people, it feels pretty damn full. So that's the first issue. But second is this number here on the left, 6,000. It says we're gonna experience 6,000 deaths in Ontario if we do no intervention. But this number is entirely misleading because right now we are on the current intervention strategy, which, me, which they're projecting 1,600 deaths. This current intervention, versus no intervention is not even possible because right now we are already into April. We cannot suddenly go back to no intervention because people are going to so be socially distant. People are not going to go to the movies. They're not going to go to bars, restaurants, and all these other places. So I don't quite understand what no intervention means. My only thought on this number is that this number is simply there to scare people who want to go to the park or who want to try and have some semblance of what life used to be like before because they're simply getting sick of it because they've already been home for weeks at a time. So this number is a bit disingenuous in my opinion to put up on this chart. Now I understand that it's obviously true that if we go back to doing whatever we were doing before that more people will die. But this brings me to the other question. Why all the panic? We need to look at a couple more numbers before we get there but it's an actual serious question. Why is there all the panic? And overarching, how much death are we willing to accept? Now, I, I don't mean to be crass. People die, and that is, you know, a terrible, it's a terrible tragedy whenever anyone dies. But the question really is, how much death are we willing to accept? 
So let's look at some of the other numbers around the world and see just kind of compare it to the Ontario number. So here we had South Korea, which did probably the most testing and the earliest testing of uh, their population. So they had, as of uh, Friday, April 3rd, they had 10,000 or so confirmed cases, and you can see that they are being tested. So let's just say that rounded up to about 450,000 or so um, by the time by the time it's all done. 450,000, they're testing about 17, 18,000 people per day. So their death rate was on this amount was 1.72. So if we take the numbers and we hold them true for Ontario, which is projected to have uh, 1,600 deaths by April 30th, that would mean that we are going to have 93,000 confirmed cases if our death rate is anywhere close to South Korea's. Um, if it's 6%, again, it's it's going to be you know about 30,000, let's just say, but that's that's nowhere near what we have right now. Again, if we're looking at the um, at the most recent numbers, again as of as of Friday. It is uh, 3,200 people infected in Ontario. So that's the issue. But again, how much death are we actually willing to risk? How much death are we willing to suffer? If we look at the CDC website, these are the 2017-2018 numbers for influenza, which is the flu. Um, they are recording that there were an estimated 45 million people sick with influenza, 21 million uh, influenza associated medical visits, so going to the doctor or something like this, 80, uh, 810,000 influenza related hospitalizations and 61,000 influenza associated deaths. So this is just the flu. This is sort of your every year standard kind of thing. Now I know that 2017 was, 2017, 18 was a, was a bad year, but this is the flu. This is a thing that goes on every year. And yet there isn't this level of panic. This is not to mention the secondary deaths that are going to happen or the um, people that are going to die because they're not getting the medical care because we shut everything down. So people cannot go to the doctor as normal. People cannot get the same medical treatment as normal because almost everything is shut down and prioritizing and focusing on, on COVID-19. If we look at StatsCan for the uh, leading causes of death. So number one, we have uh, malignant neoplasms, which is, is cancer. Um, down here, number two, uh, heart disease. Uh, forgive me, this chart is, is not in order, I don't know why, um, but we have here influenza, again, the number six leading cause of death in Canada with uh, 8,500 people being killed. Now, if we look at the financial side, again, sort of the, the flip side, then we have here a, a report according to Bloomberg, um, 2.13 million Canadians are out of work since March 16th, or 11% of the total workforce. Now, this is most definitely going to lead to bankruptcies, a chain of bankruptcies, a chain of people losing their finances, unfortunately, likely, and sadly, a chain of suicides. This is not to mention, you know, possible other collapses, you know, a domino effect on bankruptcies and financial implications, which will then cause people to have much more negative health income, uh, health outcomes. This is also connected to the fact that the government is going to lose millions and millions, billions actually, billions and billions of revenue dollars, which otherwise could be spent on social programming like healthcare. So again, how much death are we willing to accept? Where are we willing to accept the risk? It's a very, very serious question. Stay safe, wash your hands, and we'll see you next time. Have a great day.